Oh, man. It got so quiet in here. Good morning, Austin New Church. You guys look beautiful this morning. Those of you at home tuning in, good morning to you as well. Um, we love you. We miss you. We wish you were here. Um, if, you're, if you're here in the room, we'd love for you to stand with us if you're able. Lord, we love you. We offer this time to you. May our minds be open. May our hearts be soft to your spirit this morning.
guys sing that with me. I don't want to. I don't want to be up here singing by myself. So let's sing. Your love is alive together. Your love is alive. Your love is alive. Your love is beating inside of my heart and my soul and my mind. Your love is alive. Your love is alive. Your love is alive. Your love is leading me into the way and the truth and the life. And we've been struck down. We're not destroyed. We've sown in tears. We'll reap in joy.
Good morning, y'all. Y'all can have a seat. My name is Katherine Johnston, and I get to do the announcements today. If you're new to ANC, we're so glad that you're here. And um, if you're not new and you don't know me, come find me. I would love to meet you and say hi. But if you're new, we'd love to get to know you. You can uh, click on this QR code or go to our website, austinnewchurch.com slash info card to fill it out. If you want to know our contact, like our emails, you can find it there. And we would just love to get to know you also. Um, an important way of you sharing your gratitude with one another and with us is through giving. And if you would like to contribute to our mission and vision at ANC, here's another link for you, austinnewchurch.com slash home slash give. Um, this QR code links to our website. There's lots of ways to be generous. And like we heard in the stories, if you heard Trey preach last week, or two weeks ago, last week, okay. Where, where is, what is time? Yeah, I don't know. Um, but we appreciate your generosity so much, and it, it really does ensure that a church like ANC, ANC not only survives, but also thrives. So thank you for your continued generosity. Um, Dustin Height, are you, is Dustin here? No, that's right, he's preaching. So Dustin and I are leading a contemplative retreat. I think there might be another slide actually, one that has a QR code, if not, it's okay. It's on our website on the upcoming events page. You can sign up now, it's gonna be September 9th, just a day-long retreat at the Stillwaters Retreat Center in Austin, Texas. So it's not as far south as the last one was. We're going to explore some spiritual practices. Dustin and I have talked about how we feel like a lot of us have deconstructed. We've like untangled a lot of maybe our childhood faith, and we want to rebraid some of those beautiful practices rather than losing them completely. And so we'll explore things like breath work, contemplative prayer, um, prayer labyrinths, poetry, just different ways to incorporate your spirituality and your Christianity um, in a space with connection. And then another announcement for you, our Santa Rita backpack drive is still going on. Today is the last day to donate backpacks right back there. There's a drop off. But if you didn't bring a backpack today, that's okay. You can donate um, on this PayPal link. I think Stephanie will still take donations. She's going to deliver them next week to the Santa Rita apartment complex, which is one of the low, uh, one of the oldest low housing communities in the nation. And we have a dear friend there, Miss Lupe, who tells us what the needs of that community are. And she asked us to donate, I think, 110 backpacks for the kids there so they can have backpacks for their first day at school. Um, and also at Santa Rita, we don't have a slide for this, but we're having a back to school party next Saturday. If you would like to give toward the supplies for that or be involved, you can email Stephanie or Melinda. And they also need hair cutters. Like, can anyone here cut hair? I cannot. If you know somebody or you know a barber, they're going to give back to school haircuts for the kids. So it'd be a great way to give back to that community. Um, I have a special announcement from Lauren. You want to come up? Lauren has started this really cool thing that you might have seen if you follow us on Instagram or Facebook. And she's going to tell you a little bit about it. Hello. If we haven't met, I'm Lauren. Um, last week when Prey Trey was preaching. He talked a lot about stories and like what we give to this church and what we get out of it. And so we thought it would be really cool kind of a way to bridge the gap of community that maybe is lacking since COVID and kind of tell our stories. So if you follow us on Instagram, I think it maybe got shared to Facebook. If not, we'll make sure it gets shared. Okay, great. But I shared a little bit about why ANC is important to me, what it means to me that this place exists. And I think that everyone has a story like that. And I think everyone has a different story like that. And it's something that we don't always get to hear. And I think it would be amazing to be able to share that. And I would love to share that. So after service, and you don't have to, have to feel pressure. We'll do this like every week that I'm here. Um, I would love to just talk with you and we're gonna get pictures of you, so it's just like a little Polaroid picture, no nope, low pressure, you know, it's not like a photo shoot, you don't have to worry about that. And then just a short kind of paragraph, few sentences, whatever you want really, about what ANC kind of has given to you or what it ha has meant to you, why you found it, why it's important to you. Um, I don't know, I think it's just gonna be a cool way to kind of connect with each other and maybe find people who have a similar story as you that you wouldn't know about. And I think it's really a sweet thing. I shared mine last week and I have gotten so many like messages, even from people that 
don't live in Austin, people that I know from college or high school even, that reached out and were like, hey, I'm struggling with my sexuality, I'm struggling with this, like, what happened? How did you end up here? How are you still at church? Kind of a thing. And so I think it would be awesome. And I'm really excited to hear everyone's stories that wants to share. So after church, I'll just be back there. And I guess online people too. If you go to our Instagram, um, oh my gosh, yeah, perfect. So if you go there, you'll be able to fill out a form too that will so even if you're, if you're a little nervous, you don't want to talk to me after service, you can do this as well. Yeah, you can fill out the form. All of the same questions will be on there, but I would love to talk with y'all afterwards. So I'll be back there, and it'll be great. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. So if you're able, go ahead and stand and find somebody you don't know and greet them. I have a question from Trey for you to talk about. He said, did you take any cool trips this summer? So talk about your vacations. on Facebook if we haven't met before. Some things that are coming up for you guys um, is the coming home weekend, as I'm sure you've heard about, is coming up on November 10th through 12th. So book your flights if you need to for that. That's coming up, I mean, in just a few months. Um, And last year was so amazing. I still am just filled with joy at all the connections that were made on that weekend. It was such a busy weekend, but we're busy filling it. I'm sure Dana is busy filling the weekend with more ANC things. Stan Mitchell is going to be joining us again to teach, and we would just love to have you either here in the room or just participating with us, even online that Sunday. Um, A little bit about me. I am married to my husband, Garrett. We've been married for almost 16 years now, and we have three kids. uh, Our oldest just started sixth grade this year, which is really fun, and our youngest is going into first grade. Um, I... I'm so excited just to be involved here at ANC and get to know each of you a little bit more. So we'll see you next week. Switch it out. Thanks. I know, right? All right, all right, all right. All right. Y'all are chatty today, chatting it up in church. It's so good to see your faces, even though I can't see your faces. Uh oh. Oh no. Oh. Not to draw any attention to what's going on and pay no attention to what's going on. Did you guys even notice that the music stand just failed and we switched it out like it was like a, like a set of tires in the pit, Jay? That's what we did. Y'all don't even know what we're talking about. So good morning. My name is Jason. If we have not met, I'm the lead pastor here. If we've not met, that's an easy fix. Coffee, beer, you name it, I'll be there. Small groups preferably, not terribly extroverted. Love all y'all in small doses. How's that? Finally 50 and finally honest about that, but here we go. So I've been out of this little pulpit for two Sundays in a row, which is rare for me, which can only mean one thing, well, actually two things. I totally forgot how to do this, and also I'm super excited to get back. <laughs> Seriously, I woke up Monday of last week, and I'm like, I don't even know what, I, how, do, how do preachers preach? Like, what's the thing? I spent two weeks, uh, had a busy couple of weeks. Colby Martin was in town, and of course, when Colby's in town, you paint the town, And then my best buddies from Mexico were here, and we ate about a $1,000 hole in this town because, you know, when they come up from the old world where I grew up, I'm going to take them every cool place and pay for it for the next seven months. And then also during these two weeks, all of my children were home from the world and college where they're distributed. For 30 hours, we had all of them in one place. So cue the photographer, right, because this doesn't happen. So now they're semi-scattered again. That happened during the last week. Also the Barbie movie, y'all. I wish I had a pink pearl snap. I think I, I think I know a place in town where I can get a pink pearl snap. 
If you've not seen it, don't take my word for it. Take Skyla's word for it. Skyla in the back, wave at us, our sound person. Skyla told me it's a, it's a drop everything and run to the theater situation, and so I did that, and I was unprepared to be that moved. I, I just, it's not perfect commentary. I know people are saying it's, it's missing. Listen, the conversations it starts are very worth having, even if it's not all the conversations. Can I just say that? Okay, good. I just said that, so there you go. Also, during, I mean, I want to see it three more times today before the sun goes down, so you'll know where to find me. Uh, Also, we did a little tangible faith deconstruction yesterday. Look at your screens. This is what we did yesterday. (laughs) Isn't that like primally satisfying? For whatever reason, uh, we were, Trey, we had a work day here, and we came to deconstruct a few things that have been collecting dust around here for a long, long time. If some of you want to shed, you're like, aw. Well, that was stuck behind the family. It would take a sky helicopter to pick it up and move it to your house, and you really didn't want it anyway. That thing was standing on like three uprights for the whole building. We're not even sure how it was standing, but anyway. So, been busy, had a lot going on. We've been gently meandering our way. That's a Texas word for those of you in Michigan or wherever. Uh, We've been meandering, or you could say moseying. That's another South Texas word, right? You know how to mosey. Uh, our way through the early parts of the book of Acts, and somehow both Catherine and Trey successfully managed to avoid, skip, jump, ignore, whatever, dance around a very scary little passage in Acts 5. I sort of left them with the reins, hoping that one of them would take a shot at this story, and they both, being avoidant of the hard story, decided to go around it. So today we're going to have some conversation around the story in Acts 5. That'll be our text. Somebody's got to take one for the team, y'all. I got this. Ooh, there was my dad. Did you see it? Oh, my kids are throwing. They're not even awake yet, and they're throwing up in their beds. We were talking about why dads can't dab. Who's, who wrote that rule anyway? We can do anything we want, right? Okay. I just did it twice. That's the last. I'm in so much trouble right now. Some of you walked in church, and you're like, where's the hat? Who stole the preacher? I'm the twin brother. Sometimes I just like to prove that I actually can grow hair. So there you go. Anyway, I didn't really intend to camp out in the book of Acts. It was sort of accidental. Uh, And I wouldn't have if it didn't make such a wonderful backdrop for the question that we've been asking ourselves around here this summer, which is simply this. Where to next? Where to now? Where are we going next, ANC? I've read deeply, deeply, deeply into the trends of the local church. Guys, it's no surprise. The epicenter of spirituality is no longer the local church for most people. We got to deal with that. Social science has said this since the 80s. We're the last to get the message because we're listening to a Dixie cup and a piece of yarn, right? Everyone else got the fiber optic message that spirituality is not, it's not limited and exclusively located within the walls of a local church. And so we get to deal with that. So that's where we've been. And so the question has been, well, then now where to, right? So Catherine and I were talking this week about the process of preaching and how a preaching series is identified and then assembled, which, by the way, I'm super stoked to announce that Katherine Johnston is joining our staff at ANC. I know, right? We've been working on this for a while. She's built her equity here the hard, slow way. She's earned her voice in this place. This should surprise absolutely zero people that we're doing this. But she's joining us on a part-time basis as our new teaching and creative development pastor. So we're going to get to hear from her regularly. She's going to help us with planning, with organizing our messaging across ways that we put that out. She's going to help us with connecting all the creative moving parts. She'll still be working with the poets and convening that. I look forward to hearing her teach way more often. Uh, Catherine has a powerful and singular voice in this little house, and I don't know how this congregation of all places in the world gets such talent, but we do. And so thank God for that. So welcome, Catherine. There you go. That was actually where you were supposed to applaud. You guys blew that. There you go. Oh, come on now, y'all. All right, let's see. Let me see if I can find my way back. See if I can preach, Tara. Where was I? Oh, yeah, that's right. Catherine and I were talking about how these ideas come to life, these sermon series. And she, of course, is far more organized with me. She always has questions about Advent. I'm like, I can't think about dinner. Advent is coming at the end of the year. We'll get to that. But, but anyway, so we were talking about these things. And I've come to accept, I think, in, at, at this age, at this ripe old age, older than most of you in the room, that my gift is attention to a singular current moment, and then the next current moment, and then the one after that. It takes a lot of help and a lot of guidance and some engineering systems for me to get me fully focused on anything too far down the line. Is anyone in the room like that, like me? Please show me that I'm not the only one in the room. So I see some heads shaking, yeah. We're large in the moment, and if you ask us about tomorrow, we're gonna, 
you know, we're going we're gonna to get there when we get there, right? That sort of thing. It's just how my brain does and doesn't work. What can I tell you? It, I, I don't think an upgrade at this point is possible, Don. I've tried. I called Microsoft, and they're not going to give me a hard drive update. So here we are. All that to say, we agreed today to, to make the, today's the, the final installment of the series, uh, Where to Next, ANC, and then we're going to transition into some other things. And I guess that means what we spent the week asking was, where to next after what where to next, which feels like a strange little loop, but it actually makes perfect logical sense to me. And here's why. What I want to speak about today, friends, I feel might be the actual bottom line or the basic algorithm, or you might call it the prime moving part that explains why the church has drifted from the teaching of Jesus and become an institution that often perpetuates as much pain and superstition as it does freedom and liberation. I'm going to say some things today that I've been waiting my whole life to hear spoken in faith spaces. And since nobody is saying them, I'm just going to say them myself. Now it feels like the right time. So today we're going to talk about how the institutional church, and listen, I'm not critiquing ANC or even the UMC. I'm talking about the church in general as it's been embodied around the world throughout history. We're going to talk about how the institutional church has relied on fear, friends, capital F-E-A-R, to attempt to maintain control over human behavior. And I'm going to set it up with the story one of my least favorite stories from the book of Acts, and it comes to us from the tail end of chapter 4 and the beginning piece of chapter 5. And let me just read it to us. Remember, this is Luke writing. Acts 4, 32. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. Verse 36, there was a Levite from Cyprus, Joseph was his name, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas. Now, don't confuse him with Barabbas, that's a different guy. Barnabas will go on to figure prominently in the, in the missionary journeys of Paul. His name means son of encouragement. Verse 37, he sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. What's the first word of verse 1 of chapter 5? It says, but a man named Ananias with the consent of his wife Sapphira. They ruined those two names because of this story. You really can't name your kid Sapphira. Sorry, it's kind of one of the, you can't name your kid Jezebel. Sorry. Bible history has wrecked a few good names. What can I say? But a man named Ananias with the consent of his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property with his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds, and he brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard it. The young men came, and I don't know who these young men were, but I have a feeling I've met some of these volunteers in megachurches I've worked for, just always at the ready, Hillsong. I don't know where these people come from. The young men, if you've not seen those documentaries, while it's hot, watch them before it gets cool and you want to be back outside. The young man came and wrapped up his body, then carried him out and buried him. Verse 7, after an interval of about three hours, and don't ask me how Luke knows about three hours. The, the details he remembers are just so odd. His wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter said to her, tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came, came in, they found her dead. So they carried her out and buried her beside her husband, and great fear seized Notice this verse, and great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. Yeah, so there you have it, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. I'm sure you've heard it before. Honestly, it's not often preached on for obvious reasons, but before we go any further, let's bring the lights up a little bit. You have the mic, Catherine? I would love to know, let's open the mic, let's open the floor here for a second. If you're new here, don't panic, we talk to each other. What rises in your mind and body at the reading of a story like this? Wave your hand and she'll come to you with the mic. Don. I see uh, two things. One, it seems very much like a cult, mm. that kind of control. Wow. And secondly, it's a picture of a very angry and vengeful God. 
Okay, so it's painting a picture of a vengeful God. Did you guys catch that? Yeah, what else? Over here. I don't know why, but this image came to mind, this memory came to mind of when I was in vacation Bible school at the Baptist church growing up, and I remember learning that God can see everything, and I thought, can he see me picking my nose? (laughs) And thinking I was going to be in very big trouble. So it's that kind of like, he's always with us, but you better watch out. You you better be careful. Don't pick your nose. Yeah, it feels a little invasive, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Back here, over here. This seems like only part of a story Hmm. because we don't know how this sharing of everything came about. Mm -hmm. We don't know who made those rules, but clearly (laughs) not everyone was in agreement with them, at least not all the time. Right, right. So, so many questions around that. Seems like a pretty intense little group of people to hang out with, wouldn't you say? Yeah, there's some high risk here. Anyone else? What rises in your body? What kind of story about God does this create? Chris. Yes. So I was an atheist for most of my adult life. And when I heard that, it kind of made my stomach kind of churn and my heart kind of get a little tense because it reminds me of the Christians that I hated at that time. Mm. It reminded me of fear and control. And that's what I did not like about that. So that's what it kind of brings up, brings up weird feelings. So of course, you're from Buffalo. So I mean, what the heck, right? You guys see his Buffalo Bills t-shirt? He's got a lot of gall to wear that thing down this far south. Yeah. Over here, over here, over here. Yeah. It just makes me wonder about what the context of, like, what was the basis for that decision that they made yeah. as a family, you know, let, to keep some of the money? Yeah. Like, why? It, was it financial security? Probably because H-E-B was Whatever. expensive back then, too, like it is now. Yeah, yeah. Patrick, in the back. We'll do a couple more. Just to point out one silver lining in this story to be a devil's advocate for a second. I will say I do appreciate that it is about the wickedness of hoarding wealth. And I feel like the church a lot of the time has lost that message Mm -hmm. or has made excuses for that part of the Bible. So, Yeah, I mean, it's embedded in a whole explanation as to how no one held anything back from the common good, friends. Where is the study of the common good in American economics these days? It's, you can... You can be a starving professor with nobody in your classroom if you do a class on the common good. Like, that's lost language. So thank you for that. Yes, yes, yes. A couple more. Just that I, I kind of, I guess I'm not in agreement with everybody here. Because, okay. I, because I, don't, I don't see some big sin in holding back some right. of your earnings. Right. <laughs> I don't also see it as a sin to be wealthy. Right. That's fair. The problem that I saw here was that somehow they needed to convince everybody that they were more generous at that particular moment. And I, uh, I can understand that because yeah. I, I, you know, I want to be a big show off too and sure. say, oh, everybody loved me. Right, right. But, but I, I just don't see it as a big sin. To hold something to back. To have possessions. Mm-hmm. And, and to use them right. in some way to That's benefit fair. others and yourself. That's fair. Okay, let's... Can I let's, just say, I just want to say one last thing. We were always told it had to do with the fact that they lied. Yeah, right, of course. Not that right. they held back. Right. It, it doesn't really say that in there, right. but that's how we always heard it preached. No, there's a lot here, guys, and we can't hit it all. We can't, you can't hit, like, the whole flock of birds here, so we're going we're gonna to dial this in in a second. But, like, what does this say about the apostles? What does this say about Peter? Just think about that in your mind. What kind of a picture? Here's... It's not my favorite story. I may have already said that. I may have already said that. I already said that. This one is frightening, guys, which I think is Luke's purpose for including it. Now, see if you can follow me around the bend here through the woods. You know this already, but I don't feel any sense of obligation to address every single story in the Bible. Friends, some of these narratives are just so weird that it's difficult to even attempt to navigate or explain them. And this story is almost one of them, but early last Monday morning... Something arced in my spirit as I sat next to Barton Springs after a jog around the lake, as I do on Monday morning. Something arced in me. Let me see if I can tell you how I arrived at the subject of fear from this frightening story of the early church. 
Something that I always ask myself when reading the Bible is this. Why would anyone write this stuff down? Of all the things that happened, why would they write down these stories? Who were these people? And what exactly were they trying to be sure that we didn't forget? So they put them in the form of writing. Now, good scholarship of ancient texts requires understanding of relevant context and cultural realities and all of that, which of course means that we have to do more than just understand the what of the story. We need to look deeply at the why as well. So the what here is pretty simple. It's a compare and contrast between Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira. And I think the story, the compare and contrast is arguing presumably that premeditated dishonesty is dangerous, if not deadly. I think that's the simple read on the story. That's the what. But what's the why? Why would Luke think that this is so important to tell his friends this story? Well, that's a really good question. It's a pretty clever question. I'm so glad you asked it. Actually, you didn't. I think of two reasons. Two reasons come to mind for me. Remember, these letters were written by the people who had firsthand recollections of the life of Jesus, and they were compiled and shared among families and fledgling communities that were doing their best to survive in an empire that was hostile to the worldview of Jesus and his teachings, to the way they saw the world. Now, I know my history as well as you know yours, and I know that within three to four centuries, by the time Emperor Constantine came on the scene, Christianity would miraculously, tragically, ironically become the colonial faith of the Holy Roman Empire itself, which is so hard to explain given the fact that this is supposedly born in the teachings of Jesus, who was a pacifist, a mystic, an enemy of the concept and the premise of empire altogether. Now, friends, I guess what I'm trying to always trace and reassemble for us here when I teach from these old writings is the process by which the message of Jesus, the good news that sets all things free, was rebranded. It was muzzled. It was gagged. It was neutered, friends, and then sufficiently remarketed to accomplish such a nonsensical and absurd end as sanctioning power and empire. That's a pretty dense sentence, Patrick. You might have to go back and read that one later. It's a lot there. I'm serious. Think about this with me for a second. How could anyone have misunderstood Jesus so completely that fear and manipulation and elaborate schemes designed to control human behavior became the narrative? How could such things as murder and genocide and church-sanctioned theft of indescribable proportions become the legacy of the church of all things? How? How did this happen? It seems impossible to imagine, yet we know this is exactly what happened. Well, what I've been throwing at you lately is this thought, which may or may not be novel to you, maybe it is, depending on your theological pedigree, but what I've been throwing at you lately is the idea that this drift away from the message of Jesus, this loss, this hard swerve away from the gospel that sets all things free, happened immediately under the watchful eyes of the apostles. Just look at the sermons they preached, trace them back and lay them over the things Jesus taught, and you already begin to see drift. And I don't say this to cause you any doubt, as you engage or interact with your sacred text, I point this out to illustrate how easy it is to lose the message, friends. If Peter and Luke did, no wonder we do too. What I'm saying is we're gonna have to dig and search to find it, which is just another way of saying that their work is the same as ours is, which is what? It's to determine exactly what of all of this still sets people free. Anyway, there must have been a reason that Luke preserved this frightening story. I actually think he names it in verse 11 of chapter five. In fact, he mentions it twice in the story, how the people were seized with great fear at what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. That was the intended outcome. I think that's the reason he wrote it down. It still has that same sinister effect on me. I remember this one from youth camp. Don't lie, God will strike you down. That was the tweet, although we didn't have Twitter back then. So why? Why did Luke think that Theophilus, if you go back to chapter one of Acts, he's writing a letter to a friend, Theophilus, which would be a great name for a fish, right? Why did Luke think Theophilus needed to know about this? Like Catherine says, how does this story move the overarching narrative forward? That's the question. We know not every detail was included in the written descriptions of the early church. Why this then? Well, I can think of two reasons. There may be more. That Luke reached for fear to motivate the faithful. Now hang with me. I hope you can make a connection to your own life. Possibly he wrote this story down because they were having resource issues. See, the people Luke hoped might read this letter, Theophilus and his extended family, perhaps they needed to be taught about generosity and the dangers of holding anything back from God. Maybe by three to four decades after Pentecost, which is when Luke presumably sat down to write this, maybe enthusiasm around taking care of the poor had, and, and the needy among them had waned a little bit. Maybe the coffers were a little thin. Maybe Luke included this story because the members of those young faith communities needed to be reminded about the importance of selling their possessions and donating the entire proceeds to the common good. Makes sense to me, seems a 
reason to write it down. And a story like this would certainly have not, it certainly would have gone a long way towards frightening people into fulfilling their agreed upon obligations, assuming that that's what they were. But perhaps even a more sinister reason than that occurs to me. It's possible Luke was seeing some drift in how the people perceived apostolic authority. I wonder if this occurred to you. Maybe one of the reasons he wrote this down was because there was authority problems or leadership issues, leadership problems. What do I mean by this? Well, it's possible that Luke believed that respect for him and the other original 12 was starting to decrease. Maybe he felt he needed to remind his audience of the apostles' authority. I mean, if you were wondering about the apostles' teaching and their authority and whether they spoke on behalf of God, a story like this would certainly have caused your ears to perk up, no? You see, if God was angry and demanding, then it follows that his earthly representatives would be too. And in the face of deception, how much more angry would they be? The moral of the story could be, you don't mess with powerful men like these. That sounds like about a thousand messages I've heard in the church in my 50 years. Friends, I'm way less interested, if I'm honest, in whether or not this actually happened the way Luke recalls. I'm far more interested in the reason he included it in his written recollection of happenings surrounding the early church. I don't know what you see here, friend. There could be a dozen things. But in my view, this story opens up the door perfectly for a conversation on how fear is often used by leaders, even by the apostles, to control people in spiritual communities. Let's get real serious for a minute. Is that okay? Pause. Have you been subject to such manufactured fear? You know the institutional church is famous for this, right? Has anyone ever named that for you, I wonder? Oh, I wonder. Has anyone ever named the ways that superstition and fear and even the shifty business of elevating metaphors, you know, heaven and hell and the underworld to concrete levels of doctrine, has anyone ever named for you that that's so damaging to good people? Has anyone, anyone ever named for you how manipulative it can be to demand full belief and support of adult people for things about which we cannot be certain? Has a spiritual leader ever named for you that fear peddling is not the work of God in the world, even though it's often the message of the church? Friends, can we be honest on a hot day in July? The church taught you a ton of things designed to scare you into docile compliance designed to control your body and your choices, especially if you find yourself in a body that identifies as female. The legacy of organized church has often been more about fear than love, and for that, friends, the church must repent. Yep, that's exactly what I'm saying, if you heard me correctly. Since the very beginning, the church has deployed fear to manipulate and control people. Dear ones, we may, may we never forget that Jesus preached a gospel of love and acceptance and transformation, not fear-based religious compliance. As you know, the problem with fear is that it can only manipulate behavior. It can never bring about true heart transformation. Hearts don't change in the presence of shame and fear, friends. So let's do this. Let's just name a few of the fears that the church has used to control your bodies and your minds. It won't, be, it won't be an exhaustive list. We could go on and on for days, and everybody's perspective will have a few different featured on the list. But if we try, I think we can hit some big ones. These ones occur to me. Fear of God's anger and punishment. How about this one? The fear of hell and being banished from God's blessing. Boy, that drives people in whatever direction you point to. Or what about this one? The fear of feminine power and authority. Yeah, I know it's the Barbie week. It's still true. How about this one, the fear of pleasure and desire? <laughs> How about this one, fear of sexual expression, especially when non-traditional to the ancient world, which is pretty narrowly defined, to be honest. Or how about this, the fear of your bodies in general? Now, we can't go into all of these fears right now. We don't have the time. But as a spiritual person, which you are, you'd be wise to take your time with all of these, doing your best to dismantle them one by one as they rise, as you are able. It'll take a lifetime, let me warn you, so be gracious with yourself. But get to work soon on tearing down these fears. If it's frightening, it's not the gospel, friend. That should, that should alert us to the truth. Know this. True love, unconditional love, constant love moves fear out of the driver's seat. Perhaps not immediately, perhaps it takes some time, but eventually love will move fear over. And never completely, perhaps, fear will always feature. But getting yourself out from under institutions and entities and relationships that exert control over you primarily through the mechanism of fear should be a lifelong goal for you. 
Remember, freedom is your true legacy, not fear-based religious compliance. What a strange message for a church in Austin in July. Well, John the Beloved writes it this way in a letter penned late in his life in chapter 4 of uh, 1 John 4, 18 reads this way simply, perfect love casts out fear. This is the wisdom of an aged apostle, of a time-chiseled lover of Jesus, the last survivor of empire from among the inner circle of Jesus. You could think of this as his final summary. Real love casts fear out. Fear will always be there working to keep us safe and alive, but it doesn't have to drive the whole machine, friends. Does that make sense to your body and mind today? Then why, dear ones, if the work of Jesus undermines fear, does the church use it so constantly to control and manipulate? Well, the short answer is because it works. Fear works. It's the engine behind American politics. I have that degree. Don't worry. I know what I'm talking about, and so do you. It's the reason super conservative churches are still growing after COVID. You see, fear works. Fear works hard. But fear, although sometimes capable of forcing technical compliance with things like doctrines and creeds, actually makes a rotten motivator for real life change. Transformation only happens when the human subject is gently, friend, when they're tenderly, willfully engaged in such a way that honors the divine nature all humans fully and entirely possess already. You see, that's what fear won't tell you. It will hold back the spoils until it sees surgical compliance. And that was never good news. This, of course, means that all these threats of hell and isolation and rejection and exclusion from the benefits of community do little to transform or unlock the infinite capacity of the human heart. And, of course, that's the goal of love in the world. Friends, fear doesn't actually build spiritual community. It assembles crowds of survivors and performers who only feel safe inside the city walls protected by strong and often angry spiritual leaders who speak with astonishing certainty on behalf of God. I offer you two documentaries about Hillsong as evidence. If you think I'm joking, that used to be the world that I moved in, friends. Go watch them after you see the race in Belgium today. Yeah. <laughs> Got to put in a little comic relief. This is some heavy stuff, guys. Now, you can have a different opinion about this story and about this subject, in, but in my view, Luke includes this story to shock and frighten the reader. And of course, we will extend him the same grace that we extend Peter, Paul, and I want to say Mary, but I don't mean Mary. Peter, Paul, and James, we threw out her letter for whatever reason. Empire couldn't tolerate women writing gospels. But anyhow, that's a separate, it's Barbie week. Good grief, right? I mean, what, what am I going to say? But we will extend him the same grace we extend the others when they add non-essential moving parts to the gospel. But we get to see through it, friend. We get to call this what this is, a story designed to frighten people into some kind of obedient compliance. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, now the preacher done lost his mind. The Bible is crystal clear. It's about saving us from hell. I wonder, friend, are you quite sure? In my experience, Christians get the angriest when you suggest that maybe the ones they dislike the most may possibly not burn forever. That's when they get the maddest. Isn't that ironic? Hell has been the faithful workhorse creating fear and trauma in the church friends for centuries. Guys, you do realize, though, that there are about five totally different independent ideas in the Bible that we mash up into our doctrine of hell. I, I, I hope you know that. I mean, if you survived Texas youth camps at all in the 80s and the 90s, you might think that the Bible is clear on hell and that sex before marriage is what ends, you, ends up sending you there. Maybe that's the message you got. But do you know the difference between Sheol and Hades and Abaddon and Gehenna and Tartarus? And do you know the difference between the lake that was apparently burning? Of course, all lakes in Texas are burning in July, but whatever. Do you know the difference between these concepts? And do you know that it's not, that's not even mentioning the times, the far more numerous and general times that the text references a pit or a grave or simply the idea of destruction? Friends, I've studied this book my entire life, and I can't tell you how to keep these ideas entirely separate. They've been welded together for a reason and preached with toxic certainty as if they are all one idea, but they were never just one idea. Friends, I no longer believe in the doctrine of hell. Not the way I was taught. I don't accept it anymore. If it's something that doesn't harmonize with the way Jesus was in the world, friends, then good theology teaches us to question and disassemble and find the gospel in the middle of it. Now listen to me. You might think I've lost my mind. Track Jesus' teaching very closely and you will find that he never even hinted at eternal, ongoing, conscious bodily torture. It's foreign to his mind completely. That was added later, friends. Jesus preached love. It's my joy to remind you. And love restores. It doesn't punish 
It doesn't torture. We've always known better. Deep breath. So where to? Is that you back in the back row, Chris? I can see you back there. Where to next, A and C? We've been asking ourselves this for weeks now. And I'm not positive we came up with a lot of precise detail. Of course, I warned you we wouldn't. I think in 50,000-foot view, right? So I told you in the beginning that this would be a discussion more of posture than of precise plans. But, oh, church, if you've been following the case we've been making around here lately, I'd say the wind is taking us back out into our communities with fresh inspiration to engage in mutually life-giving ways. Our message will not be rooted in sin or shame or a message of exclusion. And fear cannot, friend, it must not be the driver. Let's embody something far more sophisticated than fear, friends. Let's embody love, transformation, and hope. Well, this final thought for you, that's your warning, musicians. I really haven't helped you at all today if all I've done is give you a reason to see how the church, all the way back to the friends of Jesus, including Luke, used fear to motivate and manipulate and control. I haven't moved the needle if I've just made you aware. You see, fear in the external world has no power over us unless it has an internal fear to match, and that's when it becomes real. The challenge isn't the text, my friend. The challenge lies within each of us. You see, the legacy of institutions that use fear to drive behavior is broken, fractured, wounded people, splintered souls, people who who have internalized that fear and become scary themselves, who have become scary to themselves and others. You see, people terrify people because they've been terrified. That's the legacy of institutions that do that. And... We can be released from that, friend. And if you're wondering how, I think it can be as simple as choosing daily to turn to love. Fear may be baked into our biology for good reasons related to survival, friends, but love is our deeper, more ancient legacy. Letting love drive, well, that's a good summary of the whole spiritual development journey, I would say. And now a song written by Sean McConnell, performed by Lamar. (laughs) No need to clap. No need to clap. Yeah.
Providence is endless Mercy is a mystery And fear is no good reason To believe in anything Say those words again. Providence is endless. Let these words land, y'all. Listen to these words, and then you can end where you almost ended before. Providence is endless. Mercy is a mystery. And fear is no good reason to believe in anything. That's it. That's the whole gospel. All right. Thank you. If you're able, jump to your feet. We burnt the clock up today. I took my time. Sorry about that. That's what happens when you get out of the pulpit, Terry. You lose your discipline. It's all good. Friends, we are not, and when I start pausing, that's like when my mom was yelling at me. We're not trying to just build a church to keep you busy on Sundays. Guys, I'm asking you to think entirely different about everything you've ever been taught. I don't know if it's I don't know how it lands on you. I don't know if it sets you free. I guess the working assumption is the things that set me free, I hope set you free as well. But guys, the reason our neighbors are uninterested in what we do on Sunday mornings is because they only hear the shrill sound of fear. That's what we've pumped to the airwaves. Unplug the old ancient Neolithic era metaphors of an underworld and of Hades and friends. It's simple. God is in the world in every way imaginable, and it's the legacy of every person to find their way home. How is that not good enough news? So if we're gonna engage our communities, let's engage them with that. Fear won't get us there. Fear won't get us there, not to transformation. All right, let's prepare our hearts for communion. We lead us in prayer. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires are known, where could we hide from your love? Remind us now of our cleansing by your spirit, which is a complete work unrelated to the, what we do about it. Remind us that we may perfectly love you as you perfectly love us through Christ our Lord. Amen. In Christ, our example, the friend, the mentor, the teacher that lived many years ago, that same one invites you and me to a table. It's got a place set just for you. It'll never be filled by anyone else. There's one for everyone, by the way, in case that disturbs you, deal with that in your heart. But he draws us to a table set for us. And as we wholeheartedly seek to act on the word we've heard today and live and walk in love and peace and justice and the good work of ongoing advocacy with one another, let us, friends, in so doing, turn our hearts now in confession to God and pray these words with me. Let your ears hear your mouth pronounce them. Merciful God, we believe that you accept our heartfelt confessions today knowing you to be gentle and kind, even when we are not, we confess. We have been distracted, at times lacking in love. We have failed to love our neighbors as ourselves because we have failed to love ourselves as you do. So forgive us, we pray, and free us to be a people of peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. And he lifted bread to heaven one Thursday evening and he broke it and he said to his friends, just hours away from the whole thing coming to some kind of closure, he says, this is my body and my body's gonna go through the same kind of breaking. And then he lifted a cup and he says, and I'm gonna seal this for all people. It's not tribal, it's not national, it's not local, it's for all people. And my blood that I will shed will be the, a, a new covenant in that regard. And so what a scandalous night, but what an open invitation. And so as the band plays one more song at the base of the stained glass, you'll find the elements. Just approach when you're ready. You can do that alone or as families, however you wanna do that. But let me lead us in this last prayer and we should all know it. Say it with me. Our Father and Mother who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Bye. 
Patrick Hill and I wrote today's benediction. I chase fear in old movie theater seats with horrible actors on screen and masked killers lurking just out of focus. This bloody brand of fake fear is comforting only because I can regain control by leaving or by shutting my eyes. But the brand of fear I found in a pew under my childhood pastor's gaze didn't come with that sense of peaceful separation. I was no longer an observer of fictional horror. I was the very real main character. The outcome was my eternal torment, no matter the path I chose. Unmasking my pastor rewrote my ending. His authority was fueled by my fear. My hopelessness intensified his power and his profits. He was the self-appointed arbiter of my salvation, and fleeing his flock set me free. Church, may we chase God not because we fear the alternative, but because perfect love casts out fear. May we always choose love over fear, community over control, and peace over pressure, no matter the cost. Go in love, community, and peace. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, 